Let's go ahead and get dirty. Miller up, motherfucker. Mr. Blade Runner, we finally meet face to face. Guys, remember that hamster from before? It's back! This interview is over. This here six shooter going right in it. I am the Great Destroyer. My name is Eric, and I'm here with collector Michael Kester. No, fuck you. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a nice net you've got there. Anyways, <laughs> today we have an exciting episode of Double Feature. Let me tell you why it's exciting. Uh, we let some people pick the movies. I don't care about that. What's exciting is that we're all done with year three. That's true. Year three is over. Year three is finally completed. Now, is it just me, or does it seem like year three took about six months longer than a year normally takes to record? Yeah, that's probably... This is a long fucking year. I think the reason is because of today's show. Yeah, we, um, we've gotten ourselves into some trouble here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing two movies on the show. What are the movies? We're going to do Mary and Max and the Killing. All right, so one movie... Is Mary and Max. Right. The other one is The Killing. This is already a phenomenal disaster. Yeah, we're really kind of trudging through right now. <laughs> we uh, we can't really celebrate beating year three yet because, right. you know, we've been doing this show every week. It's been an identical length to the other years, but we still have, we have miles left to go, my friend. That's we true. have to get through today's episode. Yes. Now, uh, we'll celebrate, yay, year three all done on the next episode of the show. Mm-hmm. Use the chapters to skip over Mary and Max, which will spoil. Use the chapters to skip over the killing, which we'll also spoil. Uh, you could skip right to the end. We'll talk about the next episode of the show. It's going to be glamorous, I'm sure. It's yeah. not going to be a big waste of your time where we make film spotting jokes. That's definitely not what yeah, that's probably be. not going to be that. Haven't done that since I don't know about a year and a year and a week from today. Yeah, something like that. So today's show is selected by you, the listeners. No, oh, I thought you, you were looking at me. No, I was like, not, excuse me. No, don't get offended yet. Th- this is an okay double feature. Kind yeah, of. no, I, part, but part of it. I just don't like being accused of selecting things I haven't seen before. Okay, so uh, the uh, the people who donated throughout the year. Yes. They, uh, wow, it's been like a week since I've mentioned the word donation. That feels weird. It feels all dirty again. We let them pick out movies. Mm-hmm. Picked a bunch of movies. And, uh, and then we randomly sort of paired them together by, let's say, an arbitrary criteria. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, two winners. I guess we'll call them winners, although mm-hmm. they now have to listen to this train wreck. Yep. Uh, we have two winners. We picked one of uh, each of their selections of movies, and we paired them together. Yes. So this is about the best we could do with the pairing of what these listeners gave us. Um, and it's still kind of a shitty pairing. Not as bad as I was thinking. The individual films, we should say, are not bad. No, no, There's not at all. There's nothing wrong with the films whatsoever. It's just that the process that your co-hosts of Double Feature <laughs> sure. go through... To put two films together is a lot more painstaking and obnoxious yes. and involves way more time at Starbucks than right. opening a pair of emails. Yeah, not this week it doesn't. This has been the easiest pairing we've ever done. It's true. We complain all the time when we have to think of all these double features. Uh-huh. Oh, this takes so fucking long. Yeah. How are we going to come up with all these shows? This week it was nice. We just showed up today. We looked over. Oh, what movies? Okay, let's watch them. That felt great. And now, now I suddenly understand why we uh why we complete the process we usually do but after all this is double feature where every movie gets its day to be the greatest film of all time it's true and so this week as with every week we are featuring coincidentally the two greatest films of all time yeah which are mary and max and the killing right so the winners then yes. everybody who donated really is a winner thank yeah. you thank you for winning the winners today are uh, mike and Ty, mm-hmm. who both picked out... I mean, I should say, everybody picked out some great films. Yeah, there's definitely some films that we're going to steal and maybe put on the show at some point. I would say almost definitely going to put on the show. Yeah. And claim to be our own ideas. So, if you're all sad pants as of last week that uh, your movies didn't get picked, totally fine. Don't worry about it. All in due time. We will probably cover every film that's ever happened. <laughs> but uh, in preparing now, we're going to have to come up with all these movies for year four. Um, we'll, we'll steal some of those. Not a big deal. So we've got the premise out of the way. Everybody knows. Some people donated. They got to pick out the movies. We're going to do the movies now. And uh, we have learned from this list that our uh, our listeners, they love 80s horror films. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they're pretty artsy and they're kind of depressed. Yeah. And that seems to be the genetic makeup of Podmanity. Yeah, it sounds like a planet. Great, great study. It really was. Yeah, and Mary and Max is no exception to that rule. Well, maybe to the 80s slasher part, but the... Uh, <laughs> Fuck, man. Not all the little, scenes. Little, uh, yeah, a little bit depressing. Just a tiny bit depressing. Yeah. So this is great because we get to talk about something that is a kind of stop motion. Sure. But has nothing to do with Henry Selleck. Right. Which is maybe a first ever uh, that anyone has ever done that. Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely call Mary and Max wonderfully depressed. <laughs> wonderfully depressed. Excellent. That, Excellent. Would be, uh, that would be the way I would describe it. Very it's, well done. I think it's also claymation rather than stop motion. You I, think? Well, those are sort of the same thing. They I can suppose. be, yeah. It's stop motion done with clay. I think that's the method we're, we're using here. Like with any stop motion, you're using a variety of tricks. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you're moving a, what's essentially a photograph. Um, sometimes you are photographing stills. Sometimes there is stuff that's being uh, manipulated live within your frame. And sometimes you just move your, your uh, figures around a tiny bit between each frame. Right. And it, so when most people think stop motion, they probably think the Henry Selleck Nightmare Before Christmas yeah. type uh, figures, right? Yeah. That these people have painstakingly created. And instead here, we are dealing with clay that is being painstakingly uh-huh. manipulated. A lot of the same technique, though. Yeah. The thing that I think I really like about Mary and Max is the stark contrast sure. between, I guess, everything in the United States and everything everywhere else in the world. Right, right. Um, the thing is, is the United States is black and white, really sad everybody's kind of careless everybody's fat it's just there's Riddle a lot of crime of, don't forget yeah. the first oh, time the, we see new york yeah, with the, the bullets yeah it's just a it's really, a bunch of fat people eating chocolate sandwiches yeah and it's a big negative portrayal of the united states we're no stranger to that we saw triplets of belleville would you say perhaps it's a cartoonish portrayal of the united states i don't know i think it's it's closer to cynical yeah sure um and then we have the other side of the story which is australia where everything is simple and yellowish basically australia looks like what we think the 70s looked like in right. the united states right in our own minds and it's i don't know that it's necessarily better though because no, well, it's still see, full of drunks it's, and yeah thieves. it's not better but it's it's more of an organic depression it's more sure. of an organic negativity where in america it be- i think it's mostly the black and white right it's really negative sad dark right. stuff <laughs> right. and everything just kind of seems really stark and a everything. land where eggs are laid by dirty prostitutes yeah exactly dirty, and, lonely prostitutes and we have i mean and then there's the transition where he sends her all of the figurines right she opens the box and it's gray and in my head i see them gray and I go, they weren't gray and sure. his, they had all these different colors, but I realized that no. No, it's the, just black and white. The only color there are what, his tongue, the pom-pom, and I uh, guess... Very, very restricted colors. Yeah. Yeah, the movie might almost mean it in a, uh, in a satirical way or in an insulting way. I mean, I suppose it doesn't, but when we see, oh, when we saw Triplets of Belleville, mm-hmm. that was one of the things where it almost struck you, almost, as offensive, yeah. just a tiny bit. It's an oversimplification of a culture. That's not something that, you know, I wouldn't be really going out on a limb to say that might offend people. Yeah. But I don't think I mind, despite the movie's intentions, whatever they may be, I don't necessarily disagree or find negativity in its characterization. I'm totally fine with fat Americans. I love eating chocolate sandwiches. (laughs) That's fine. I love that our babies come from dirty, lonely prostitutes. Yeah. I think that's magnificent. That is fucking wonderful totally fine with that i would rather a prostitute baby than a catholic baby or a jewish baby or a rabbit baby i really don't want any babies that come out of eggs i mean if that's beer that's my only choice is beer you know what i don't want a beer baby either there's there's no type of baby i like nor do i like babies coming out of beer nor do i like beer there's no win for me in this situation Aside from that, though, let's go back to chocolate sandwiches. Okay. Totally fine with chocolate I sandwiches. I hate, I would rather eat a baby than a chocolate sandwich. This is what these people have paid for. So in Mary and Max, we get a lot of incredibly dark moments. And I'm not talking sure. about the black and white or any, you know, I'm not, You're not using a visual pun. That's yeah, the next movie. Yeah, exactly. I'm talking about these fucking dark scenes. I think two of the darkest one per character, is when Mary is about to kill herself. Sure. She pops a fistful of Valium, 
She's standing on a table. She's crying. It's just so painfully dark. They do the K Sera right, song. right, yeah, yeah, the Pink Martini song. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of fucking. It's abysmal, really. Yeah, it's that whole scene is really excellent. It's like you've reached the rock bottom. You're at the end of what is the downward spiral. Sure. You find what's down there, uh-huh. and it's this musical number and these floating paintings, and uh, it's a bad... You know, the movie treats darkness as if it's kind of a light, normal part yeah, of life. it's whimsical. And then it gets to that moment, and you think, man, this is, a, this is instead whimsy that feels dark yeah. you know what i mean we're talking about something that's dark sure but now even what would be a whimsical moment in the film is itself a little fucked yeah. up well it never loses sight of the fact that it is claymation right it's always aware that it's using a childlike medium sure and it never fully divorces itself from it it never goes to say come on clay can be dark too yeah right right it's always it, i mean it is I, I i know we shouldn't compare it but it's our only point of reference sure it's similar to henry Selick when he did Coraline. sure where it's dark as shit it's <laughs> right. fucking dark yeah but it still has a childlike mentality about it yeah and it's not always bad stuff that comes off terrifying and dark in right, this film right when max wins the lottery I almost cried <laughs> right. watching him sweat. Sure. That was horrifying to right, me. Right, right. That was such a scary looking thing. And in reality, the situation is wonderful. But for some reason, the composition of that scene came off as grave and shocking, which sure. I think is supposed to because right. Max doesn't like anything to shake his balance. Sure. And even something positive is earth shattering. And the film does a lot of stuff where I guess you would call it wild card play. That's what I'm calling it. That's the official term. Great. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking about. I think they tease it with her neighbor who has the homophobia then becomes agoraphobia. Oh, sure. Right. Where for this is one of the funniest things that the film does where she keeps talking about him being agoraphobic and he's afraid to come outside of his house. But every time he starts to, something horrible happens and he Right. It's yeah. not that he's retreating out of sure, fear of the outside. Sure. He's retreating out of self preservation. Right. He's gonna get hit by an ice cream truck. Right. He's gonna get eaten by a dog. Yeah. Terrible sure, things are sure. happening and he needs to go inside to protect himself. His fear ends up being uh kind of validated. Yeah, exactly. It saves his life several times. <laughs> right. But the other thing that the film does is it toys with that kind of concept the entire time where the film lets you know that really there is nothing that's out of bounds. Mm-hmm. Either of the characters could die at any moment. Sure. You don't think for a second that she might not kill herself. You don't see right, right. her with the noose and the Valium and think she's the main character. Something's going to stop her. She won't die. It'll be fine. Exactly. No, that doesn't even cross your mind. And, 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 and when you see them lowering Max out of the building, when right. he has the brain meltdown. Sure. My first thoughts are, oh, yeah, he's dead. Right. Not, oh, they can't kill him. There's got to be some hitch here where he's still alive. It's the opposite of what you usually see. Yeah. Where where they tempt you with killing a character and you know they won't do that. Right. Instead, here, the fact that they didn't kill the character is legitimately surprising. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, it's doubly surprising when she walks into his apartment and it's been, oh, my God, we're finally uniting after having corresponded after all these years and she kind of walks in and i'm just sitting there going he probably had a heart attack yeah he's dead right that's what the film is gonna do here and then they do it and i'm still surprised (laughs) and upset by it. yeah you're right there's nothing it's really holding back yeah i mean that would uh ruin everything it's trying to do sure the entire thing is this sort of portrayal if you can't reach the darkest places of that, you've copped out. Yeah. You're not really telling a story about sure. that. You know, from their first letter, they're talking about things that are going to make people uncomfortable, uh, maybe just given the medium. Sure. You know, I need to, we touched on this in Coraline, but you start using a, a medium that almost looks like it could be a children's film. Right. And then everything is a little bit more, wow, I can't believe you did that. Yeah, exactly. Um, when they start sending these letters back and forth, the kind of things that Mary is asking him. Yeah. And it, what's funny about that is that none of that gives her anxiety, but he, the older man in this situation, who would be looked at, um, I mean, uh, all of this goes without saying, it's it's very subtle that they don't, you know, 
really feed into it. But he would look, be looked at as the predator in this situation. Sure. That's something her mom is concerned right. about. That there's some 40-year-old man talking to my daughter. Something weird is going on here. Why don't and, you have a seat over here? And instead, he's the one that gets the anxiety. And uh, never mind even that, but I just love how uncomfortable you know, we can be as viewers with the fact that these two are just talking. You know, you talked about this during uh, when we did Catfish this uh-huh. year. Just the, uh, the mere notion, it made you even uncomfortable that somebody older would have any kind of relationship, even a pen pal, with a younger girl. Sure. We talked about that exact situation. Sure. And we kind of know mentally that there's nothing weird going on there, but it feels wrong. That's what society tells yeah, us. It, it feels can't like be you right. need to just put a stop to it. And they do manage to you know, get around uh, her drunkard mother trying to throw out the letter, mm-hmm. although it smells like fish. But the things they correspond about, it's not just sex, it's religion. Or right off the bat, it's yeah. religion. Uh, Max is a Jewish atheist, which some may say is redundant. Mm-hmm. But he's talking about how you know reading has influenced his decisions, and he has this neighbor that's an atheist. And I think that's one of the things that makes the prostitute joke even funnier. Yeah. It kind of says, too, that you know when we're considering how this movie feels about America— being, uh, I think, the, the second Australian movie we've ever done. It was this in Wolf Creek, right? Yeah, I believe so. You know, you have that sense, that, that fucking question that doesn't matter at all. Mm-hmm. Is the movie making fun of us as Americans? And this is one of those things when you're talking about uh, lonely atheist prostitute babies. It's, you know, our main protagonist is an atheist, yet he's making these jokes about this. It kind of feels like that might be the same way about the creators of the film. Yeah. Like they're, they have these jokes about America, but at their heart, they may feel like they're laughing at a good friend. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're making fun of, Oh, we already talked about that just in the Australian scenario. We're still talking about a country full of addicts with psychological problems who are also thieves. Right. That's the same thing happening in Australia (laughs) in this movie as happening in America. There's not a lot of difference there. They're kind of, uh, they're making fun of their own a bit. And so aside from being just that personal story about these two individuals and Mm -hmm. their relationship and a lot of these struggles that they're having, it's also commenting on uh, the larger society. It's talking about things like, like Overeaters Anonymous. Yeah. Which the first time you see that is just God hates fat people, which I think is (laughs) fucking perfect. I think it's beautiful. That was a dirty shame we first talked about that, right? Yeah. Just being a 12 step. Yeah. Just being a religious organization, thinly masquerade. I mean, if anybody, this is the, it's satirical of itself. If anyone read the 12 steps, you know, the thing, the fucking group is named after, they would see how full of religion the entire organization Mm -hmm. is. It really can't get much more plain than that. But the movie manages to poke fun at it by making it even plainer. It's a chalkboard that says, God hates fat people. All you need. And so sometimes that feeds commentary. Sometimes that stuff just feeds the story or the style or the overall themes. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like him losing the lottery, kind of one number at a time. Just the movie showing how it can fucking punch you in the face over and over. I love that he names off his numbers right against the other numbers that are clearly not his. Right. You will not win the goddamn lottery until he does Uh and uses it for chocolate. So that puts this in line almost with something more like Cold Souls. I think that would have been a a pretty good theme heavy double feature to do something like um, Mary and Max and Cold Souls. And, you know, I'm glad we covered a lot of the stuff that's the meat of the story, Mm -hmm. the content. And I feel like an awful person for doing this, but I can't, anytime I see a movie like this, I can't ignore the medium and talk story. That's very difficult for me to do because I see this, this fucking brilliant claymation in front of me, and it becomes such a a marvel of human ingenuity. It becomes such a shiny example of people who are masters of their craft that that takes precedent for me. Mm -hmm. It distracts me. I can't get (laughs) beyond the fact. I just look at it and say, wow, that is... yeah." No, I, it's I amazing totally that it exists. You. Yep. you know what I mean? You know, and every time I see something that plays in this genre or plays in, uh, I guess, more appropriately, this medium, mm-hmm. it seems like it's always coming years beyond the one I saw previously, which isn't true because I can I can juggle these movies. I can watch them in sure. any order and I can go, wow, this is this is the prime example of yeah. this medium at its very best. Uh-huh. Look at the things they're accomplishing here. Look at the effects. And I watch Nightmare Before Christmas, and I see that. And I watch Coraline, and I see, oh, it got that much better. 
And then we watched Nightmare Before Christmas after that for the show. And I think, man, how did they, it never really got as good at this. Yeah. Did it? And, you know, we see Mary and Max and I'm thinking, these are things I have never seen before. Look at how they're playing with color and managing to do these different things. Part of it, too, is looking at this movie in high definition and just seeing how beautiful and sharp and clear it is. Yeah. I have terrible eyes. So I have a, a problem in photography with focus, just getting a really sharp focus. It's something I'm insanely jealous of people who can do mm-hmm. because I just, my eyes suck too much and I'm awful at it. And to see every single frame of this movie is probably the sharpest fucking thing I have ever seen in my entire life. Completely crisp and full of detail and shows off the, it, it looks sharper than if you were sitting in front of the models and in front of the clay itself. Mm-hmm. And that's something you need to really show off the work that all of these people have done. The minute, painstaking uh, uh, work that they've accomplished. Yeah, well, you see a lot of that in just the way the characters look and mm-hmm. all the, the people kind sure. of are formed. Because it's a lot of times when they do any sort of animation, whether it's claymation or cartoon or 3D, whatever, they tend to fall into caricatures. Sure. Sometimes that works. A lot of times that works. Triplets of Belleville is a prime example of when caricatures work. Sure, the visuals become absurd. But in a film like Mary and Max, where it's so emotional and there's so much beyond the eyes of these characters, you know, you actually care about more than just whether or not they're going to be able to ride a bike uphill. Right. Well, we're talking about their entire families dying, their sure. alcoholism, their uh, Asperger's. I mean, sure. it's it's a lot of heavy stuff, even though the movie tries to trick you with its whimsy and it keeps bringing up that goddamn theme uh-huh. as if you're going to forget. And you really do forget yeah, every do. time it comes right back down to the hard stuff. Yeah. And so the characters, they do a really good job of making particularly Mary and Max mm-hmm. look human but not real right you see max you see mary and in your head you go i know exactly what they would look like if if they they were were a human being janine garofalo oh sorry something like that you know it's just you can picture it and it's not exaggerated it's not insane you're not laughing at the way they look right but at the same time they certainly don't look like perfect pictures of the human form yeah they have their own unique style but it isn't strange enough that you can't identify with them or you can't believe that you know they're feeling the things that the story is trying to portray right sometimes the movie will venture the direction of things that are a little more absurd uh, particularly in the animals when you see these animals they have this frozen look on their face no matter what the animal is doing if it's happy or sad or interacting they they have this look as if they're uh, something awful is happening. Yeah, they're extremely worried. They're shocked. Uh, yeah, this a uh, look of shock, like they've just been punched in the stomach. I mean, it's sort of a little bit more set dressing than characters at mm-hmm. that point. Those animals are a little bit more about the world and less about the people whose story we're telling. And so I think it's okay for them to be more absurd. That doesn't detract anything. That just builds into that world. So the movie leaves us with an excellent excuse to uh, get out Bad Cat, doublefeatureshow.com forward slash Bad Cat, and then we just move gracefully, easily into the next film. Yeah, another another film that features a starring animal. You just can't let this horse go, can you? I didn't think you really cared about animals. You didn't strike me as a oh, we pet guy. About, I was talking about that bird. Oh my God. Okay, you're right. So this movie's called The Killing, clearly because killing. of what happens to the bird. <laughs> It's one of those titles. You you almost, you almost want to go, who is the true killing? <laughs> right. Are they making a killing? Yeah. Is the man shot the killing? Are they really killing themselves? Are they killing the horse? Is it perhaps all of these killings? This is uh, some pretty fucking legit noir. Now, this is Stanley Kubrick, mm-hmm. who we covered before in The Shining. Yep. And we covered uh, in Eyes, Eyes Wide, Wide Shut. Shut. Right. And so... Clockwork Orange as well. Popping up all over the goddamn place. And so if I'm thinking Stanley Kubrick, she's doing a piece of film noir, I've never heard of this before, I'm thinking Mm neo-noir. I'm thinking we're going to try and shoehorn noir into The Shining and talk about how they're shadows or something. Right. But in fact, this is from good old 1956. I mean, we're talking about noir in the noir era. 
I mean, this just snuck right in yep. there. Also, something that sneaks in there out of nowhere when discussing the killing is lights in the frame. Well, what is that thing when you're hiding in plain sight? Yeah, I think <laughs> that's what's going on there. So we're talking about one of Kubrick's earlier movies, and this gets in that realm of a director's movies where you might even call it their first movie, depending on what you personally consider a movie. Sure. So a successful movie that lots of people talk about Maybe The Killing is the first one. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not as widely known as, you know, Dr. Strangelove. Right. But it's not nearly as obscure as uh, Killer's Kiss or Fear and Desire, the the things that no one has actually seen. Right. And it's not a short film, and Mm -hmm. really nobody counts the short films. Sure, and it wasn't made for TV. I believe uh, when this was sent to us, it was sent under the, um, the heading of, hey, Stanley Kubrick's first movie, that could be good to do on the show. And it's, uh, you know, it's a full screen movie, too. And I just want to touch this briefly because I know we uh, I thought we definitively covered it earlier and it turns out we just did a terrible job. And this is also a bad place to talk about it. But while we're on the disaster episode of Double Feature, Uh I, I don't mind at all. There's this long held debate about if you watch Kubrick movies in full screen or in widescreen. Yeah. The widescreen appears to be cropped. And so that was my thinking previously is, well, he probably meant his movies to be seen in full screen. Mm -hmm. But I was reading something, actually, I think it was about The Shining in particular, where he was talking about how he shot with widescreen in mind, but essentially uh, made sure that the top and bottom of the frame would be clear so that, you know, depending on whatever aspect ratio they used for TV and video, what he saw as what would be the definitive versions of these films years and years and years from now, that those areas would be protected. And so in his life, those were the only releases he ever authorized. But when he shot for cinema, he said, of course you compose for widescreen. You know, why wouldn't you compose for widescreen? So that seemed to really be his intention. But that's why you see, you know, when you compare... The Shining in full screen to The Shining in widescreen, it looks like the widescreen version is cropped Mm -hmm. simply because he's using a sort of a full screen sensor. It's being exposed to film in full screen. And then when it was projected, it was projected in widescreen. Right. I don't know if that clears up the debate so much as adds to it. Muddies it a little bit more. If people want to know what Kubrick's vision was or if they want to see every inch of the frame that was captured as he was filming the movie. Or what the fuck that means in relation to the killing, which appears to be uh, in full screen. So if we're traveling back to Noirland, just to completely switch gears here, Mm -hmm. we're dealing with some heavy voiceover this Uh time around. Yes, we are. And this is not your normal kind of voiceover. It it feels a little sinister to me. Yeah, well, it seems seems a little bit almost like a urgent newscast. Right, right. So what do you think adds that newscast feel? Is it just the guy's voice? I think it's the guy's voice, and I think it's the way that it's layered on top of everything. Oh, sure. I think the way it's mixed into the rest of the soundscape of the movie, Mm -hmm. it makes it seem like he's not a part of the film. No, not at all. And instead, he's watching it. Well, indeed, he's not a character, right? Right. Instead, it's almost like he's watching it with you. It's almost like we're watching a dramatization of... How the killing unfolds. Yeah, this is old-timey news coverage. This is that kind of late-night, dark times, now reporting sort of thing. And it's not a mystery, either. It's a crime that we're watching. It's almost like a heist. Yeah. It is, in fact, a heist. Yeah, but it feels more like these are people doing something wrong. You know what I mean? We still see a little bit of planning, but this isn't Rafifi. This isn't a bunch of guys going in on a job. It's not Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, right, right. It's still one last job before I get out, because uh-huh. that's just what it has to be. But this is a bunch of men who thought they could get away with uh, a crime. Almost unsolved mysteries, right. kind of. And if uh, they had tried to get away with the crime, oh, what, another five years past the Hays Code, they'd probably they have gotten have, away with it, too? They may have gotten away with it. I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you damn Hayes. <laughs> I think his listing of the times helps as well in the, the sure. voiceover. The fact we're constantly talking about, you know... At 11.58 a.m., this sure. is where the, you know, the men were in, their, um, in the grand scheme of their plans. But this was Art Gilmore who did the voiceover, and he did a lot of radio and some ads and documentaries at the time, too. So he was very familiar with that subject matter. I think that's a very intentional thing that they got this guy to give this sort of presentation that, at the time, 
you know, it's like hearing Brian Williams narrate a movie. Right. And the great thing is it stands up now, 50 years later, when uh, neither of us have readily heard Art Gilmore do just about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go back to these old broadcasts and find this voice, and that was clearly his profession. But we don't identify with it saying, oh, this is a voice of the news because I know this guy. Right. So let's talk about our players just a little bit here. There's uh, Sterling Hayden. He's Johnny Clay. Um, who is in, you know, in the noir realm, uh, The Asphalt Jungle, a big piece of film noir. He is essentially the last man standing here. And we'll come back to him a little bit in the end with his devastating briefcase. Yeah. But as somebody I don't know if you would call that a briefcase. His overstuffed man purse. I'm not sure what you want to call it. We have seen, um, I believe his name is Alicia Cook. Uh-huh. Uh, junior on the show before. Oh, you know who I'm talking about? Are uh, we talking the house on Haunted Hill? <laughs> right. The that ghosts guy. weren't here, but they'll come for you. Yeah. Who turns directly at the camera? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we saw him on uh, House on Haunted Hill, the William Castle movie featuring Vincent Price, if I remember right. correctly. Which we, we paired with Clue. And I think he was in Rosemary's Baby. Allegedly, too. he's in I Rosemary's uh, Baby. <laughs> I can't figure out. I remember seeing his face. Maybe he sells the apartment. Is he the doctor? No, he's not the doctor. Not the, he's in Rosemary's Baby somewhere, I promise you. We've seen him on the show before. He was in a lot of this old noir stuff, too. You know, I've seen him in the Maltese Falcon. He was in The Big Sleep, um, Electric Light and Blue. So certainly no stranger to any of this genre stuff. It feels so... Uh, something about it feels really pure. Going back to a movie of this time and finding people who are in it legitimately rather than as callbacks to the right. old movies sure you know a lot of people must be watching this today and thinking oh wow they got these old noir actors and look how this looks like authentic noir and then finding out it's in the fucking 50s these are authentic noir actors because they're typecast because right. these were the movies they were in when that genre was huge right another one is uh probably my favorite character although she doesn't get a lot of screen time is uh mary windsor who plays sherry Mm. not the kind of sherry you found in the bottle in the previous film okay but the character sherry if we were still playing the uh the classic double feature noir recasting i was i was wondering if that was going to come up uh i'm not going to put you on the spot here but a little vera farmiga going on there i don't think that she's necessarily particularly married to any director so we couldn't do it in the choose a director's actors camp so i think there's maybe just a tiny uh physical resemblance yeah uh, more than anything else what makes her stand out to me are these noir type quips that uh, she's exchanging she is so fucking mean to george yeah she is especially before uh she knows about the money Uh uh-huh that's where you see that She's mean, uh, not just in taking advantage of him, but just in their everyday casual life. Right. She's the mean person that he married. She doesn't even get nice to him when he has buckshot in his cheek. (laughs) Right. Yep, that's all there is to it. She's done with him by that point. And I think that makes this really some of the most, uh, some of my favorite noir women banter. You know what I mean? We've talked about the femme fatale before having these kind of one-upping exchanges uh Mm -hmm. we saw it in double indemnity we've seen it in a lot of the um the film noir that we've covered but hers is just uh, part of what it is is that you know she's so good at it she just hurts george there's no back and forth right you know she's telling him uh she cuts off one of his stories she's just like yeah where's the where's the climax here and her reactions are fucking hilarious she's talking about you know how he's giving him a headache and stuff and the poor guy does not fight back at all. Mm -hmm. It's as if she's sparring with the male lead who, you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for how the femme fatale always had to kind of stand up to these huge leading men in the movies and how uh, women kind of furthered their place in film across that genre. But she has no one to fight with here. She is just beating down a tiny, sad man. Would you say that she's beating a dead horse? You're just going to ride that joke to place, huh? To win. I hate you. I hate you. (laughs) I'm going to punish you by talking about lighting. That's that's what you get. I apologize in advance. If Sherry is one of my, uh, one of my favorite femme fatales for how, uh, you know, the sort of brevity she has here for how tiny her scenes are. I think that this is definitively my favorite film noir for lighting. Okay. And and I don't know that I see a single Venetian blind in Uh the entire thing. No, I really don't think you do. Starkest fucking whites and the crispest blacks. And it's just this intense low key stuff um, used in more of an extreme than probably any other piece of film noir Mm -hmm. I've seen. 
And that's part of how it generates uh, this look I really enjoy. One of the scenes that uh, I would pick out as as being one of the greatest is that scene where they're sort of planning the caper. Yeah. And they have that little table there. They might as well be playing, you know, poker on it. It's sure. a smoky room, backdoor poker table meeting scene. Mm-hmm. And they have this single clamshell heat lamp kind of uh, over the table that, you know, normally when you shoot something like this and you have a very narrow area of light, you need your lighting rig to be pretty narrow. But they use this open bowl kind of lighting, which could cast the light uh, very broadly, except it's hanging so low, our characters nearly hit their fucking head on it. Later on, one of our characters actually does hit his head on the light. Yeah, he really walks into the the fucking light. And so something about not doing your three-point lights, something about just having, at the very least, the illusion of one light coming down on these people Mm -hmm. makes everything seem like... How people think of Dr. Strangelove, sure. a bunch of men sitting around at a table planning something that the public doesn't have access to. Sure. This is a fucking secret meeting, if you've ever seen one. Uh, smoke coming across the, the lamp and all. There's a scene prior to that that's pretty great, too, where Sherry's scheming with her lover. And so we have a different kind of scheme. But, you know, <laughs> sure enough, there's this lamp lit from below, again, making everything look really, really sinister. A lot of that light comes from uh, within the frame. As soon as I mentioned this to you, I know you saw it yep. pretty much goddamn everywhere. Yep. What's generating the light also happens to be props within, uh, <laughs> within every frame of the movie. Yeah. You know, it's not offset lighting. It's not behind the camera or high above the frame where you can't see it. They just have all of their lights on the set. And, uh, and while that's not in every scene, and a lot of times, again, it's the illusion of having all their lights on the set. The film is not shy about that at all. It's something you can do particularly well in black and white film because it doesn't seem to blind the audience as much. Yeah. If you have a light shining in someone's eyes, for some reason in a color film, something about that color balance, it really makes it feel like you are shining a light in front of someone's eyes. But here that's what helps give those you know, stark highlights, the, uh, the very stark whites that you see, is the fact that the light is in frame. And also helps to make sure that what's in light is very selective. Mm -hmm. Everything is in black. It's, uh, you know, the old school Batman animated series thing we talked about. Where you start with a black frame and you add components to it. You, uh, you know, you paint through the shadows, you paint the inverse. That's what Kubrick is doing with the lighting here. He's saying, all right, I'm going to start with a black canvas. You're not going to be able to fucking see anything. And then what small select details do I want to bring forward? This is kind of an interesting method for him. Because, you know, we talked about how he's known as one of these directors who likes to get all his details right. And sure. Do, he's a perfectionist. Yeah. You hear about how he's done a million takes or whatever. And so in an early movie, that kind of makes you curious. I hear a director hasn't quite figured out their signature yet, how much of that actually comes through. And I think this is one of the small details where you don't see as much of that perfectionism throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. Although it's still very careful oh, yeah. about what it's doing. But even in his lighting choice, he is picking out each and every individual article of what's going to be highlighted, what the viewer is even going to be able to see. Right. So let me get back to your area of expertise for a second. Is shooting a horse murder? Shooting a horse is not murder. Are you even sure what it is? I I love that conversation. Yeah. I that's such a, he convinces him really well. Yeah. Right. Sure. Well, I mean, he, it, the thing that's weird is I'm sitting there assuming this guy's shooting the horses of the same gravity as shooting a person and the sure. guy goes but you're just shooting a horse you're not going to kill anybody yeah, not a big deal at which point i go yeah shoot the fucking horse yeah i would shoot a horse isn't that amazing it goes from money it goes from something you'd never get involved in five thousand dollars to help with what's the equivalent of a bank heist mm-hmm. some of our more desperate listeners may listen to that and say yeah sure i'd totally take that offer but i think in most rational people's minds they go wow that's not a lot of money yeah. maybe by by that standard but for the magnitude of what they're attempting to pull off i don't even know if $5000 is that good of a deal back then and there's a a bit of suspension of disbelief with a lot of kind of caper movies or heist movies where sometimes people get the raw end of a deal and you go why are they even getting involved or their situation is fine and someone talks them out of retirement for really no good reason you go along with it here our characters will really talk us into why he should do that. And they do a fucking convincing job. Yeah, for sure. It's just a horse. At the worst, you'll get in trouble for inciting a riot or shooting a horse out of season. It's hilarious and it works, which is the best fucking part. <laughs> 
So when you actually see the plan unfold, the first piece of that uh, chain of events, I suppose, is the bar fight scene with yeah. Maurice. It's with- the earliest one I can remember. Yeah. Although I suppose you could argue the entire thing is the chain of events unfolding, mm-hmm. but when they really get there on that day right. and get to work. And that's shown again later in greater context. So that's a, another thing that makes this a little bit different from other noir movies or a lot of other movies even of the time is you're getting this sort of Jackie Brown multiple angles. Right. You know, uh, yeah. here's where this thing you saw previously actually fits into the chronology. And when they really get down to business, I mean, I'm thoroughly impressed with this plan. You know, they get in there and they have the distraction. They have the moments that are beautifully executed. Sure. This is a film where we see the heist go off pretty much without flaw. Well, the thing that I kind of noticed is that every individual person has a hitch that they are pretty much able to bypass. Mm -hmm. Prime example, the woman coming out to stop the police officer. Sure. He just kind of goes, I don't have time for that. Yeah, right. I mean, there's stuff like that that seems like... Could have gotten in the way, but these are really the professionals they claim to be. And and, uh, another example is when the lead comes out after throwing the money out the window, the cop stops him, says, hey, now wait a minute here. He punches him in the face and just walks away. And in all the commotion, manages to get away flawlessly. That's an incredible sequence. I mean, just to, you know, pick out one out of the entire film. That disguise he has, it's smart enough that it surprises you. It seems like, well, man, I wouldn't even thought of that. He has this kind of clown mask that, um, you know, when he's holding up the actual tellers and making them stuff the bag, he gets them to walk into another room, and then he takes off the mask, which is enough right there that I would be such a bad criminal. I'm already thinking, oh, yeah, take off that mask so people won't notice you. Good idea. Right. Very good. Wouldn't have thought of that. But I mean, he's also dispensing with the gloves and then the coat and then he puts on glasses. Yep. He's done a fucking Superman here in the uh, in the office where they keep this money. He's completely indistinguishable from when he held these guys up. And he's just covering his tracks here because they're locked away in an office. In all likelihood, he could have stuffed the mask in the bag and just took off. Right. But he's uh, he's basically guarding himself against if they just decide to walk out of that room right. and tell somebody in case he can't get out of the building in time before his cover's blown. But he forgets not to walk out of the door that says you shouldn't be in this door. Right. Damn it. One other film noir staple that uh, we get a little bit of a twist on towards the end is uh, not the bird falling into the camera, <laughs> which is... Also amazing. That's another great stark that's lighting a, scene, That's too, more of a Wes face. Craven staple. Wes Craven would have an exploding bird. Oh, I'm sorry. Johnny gets out. They're going to the airport. They've just about got away. Uh, the big shock at this point here is that we have a film from 1956 and everybody's getting away. Right. You know, most of the damage has been done, but even the double-crossing woman has, you know, gotten hers in the end. And Johnny's getting away with his uh, girlfriend. Everything's going to be totally fine. Except, oh no, he can't check his luggage in. Right. Or uh, he has to check his luggage in. Or I'd, I've never I'd, been to an airport. I I'm can't a crazy person, so I hate the TSA and I refuse to fly. So I don't know either. Okay. But we have no idea about, let's just go ahead and cut this off right here before we speculate on TSA check-in procedure. What I was getting at is when they're outside. Mm-hmm. And so the bag's being uh, carted around, uh, you know, in the... What's that place called? Poodles. The place where the airplanes go by. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, airport. Ferryway, is that? I've never been on an airplane. All right, leaving it behind. Totally leaving it behind. Anyways, my point was, you're already starting to get some of the the shadow on his face. You know, the um, we've talked about before with the Venetian blinds, the point being to invoke this idea of prison, to make you feel like these are guilty men and it's only a matter of time until they're caught. And so rather than the blinds outside, you have the shadow of the chain link fence on the guilty party. And then the bag blows open. (laughs) You feel pretty fucking awful. I mean, it lingers there long enough that I think it's painful watching that money fly away. Well, you see it fall and it falls in kind of a giant wad. Mm -hmm. And slowly the wind whittles the wad away. And I'm sitting there going, run out, get the fucking wad (laughs) of money. Right, right. But they just let it kind of float away. Well, it's one of those things where as it's happening, you're just going, shit, there's nothing I can... Oh, there it goes. That's terrible. It's letting your air conditioner fall out of your window and hit a pedestrian underneath. Something like that. So, Bill by goddamn Bill, it flies away. You see their entire plan really unravel into the air before his eyes. 
and it ends on him being cornered. It ends on the police approaching you. It's just such a perfect ending for it. Well done, both films. Bravo, really. <laughs> Uh, well done, people who picked the films, and uh, and well done, people who talk about the films. I was gonna say fuck you to the producer for pairing them up, but that, that works really too. Is, uh, should we blame the producer for that? Yeah, I blame the producer. This has been a wonderful experiment. It's enlightened us uh, thoroughly about our audience, and it means that year three is finally over. Yeah, goodbye, year three. So, double feature show at gmail dot com. Let this be a lesson to everyone, though. After an entire year. Right. That so, if you send us uh, your your favorite movies that you'd like sure. us to do on the show, uh, just don't do that. Yeah, now the email address has officially gone back to you can send us movies and we won't pay attention. Yeah, right. Next time on Double Feature is when we're going to talk about how we felt about the grand experiment that we will call Year 3. So see any of the movies that you haven't seen for the entire year. You mm-hmm. can fill your week doing that. And we'll be back next time with a spoiler-free... Basically, we're going to summarize every single film, sentence by sentence. That would be an awful show. We're going to talk about the entire year. We're going to talk about some good stuff, some bad stuff, some Some pairs, email. We're going to read people's emails. This is And the most exciting part is that it's coming to you live. Oh, I forgot about that, too. From Double Feature Headquarters. Yeah, so since I'm too lazy to edit what will be a nine-hour show, I'm sure, uh, we're not going to edit anything. It is completely uncensored. We are recording it live, as I suppose we're always live when yeah, we, we are record. Live. Let's not get bogged down in that. Completely uncensored. We're going to tell you about some movies without any spoilers. Won't that be a weird time? Watch some unspoiled fucking film. Bye.